Hi everyone and welcome to Astro at Home presented by Discover the Universe. My name is Lindsay Mann and I'm really excited to get into our topic today but before we do that I'd like to remind you about our house rules which are about respect in our chat. So we would love for you to send us as many questions as you can come up with and we'll do our best to answer them but we ask that you not spam the chat by sending several messages at once and we ask that you stay respectful to one another. If you break those rules we will put you in a timeout which means you won't be able to ask questions for about five minutes so we just um, beg that you please uh, keep that in mind as we go forward. Today our speaker is a new guest to Astro, uh, Astro at Home. Her name is Jenna Hines and she's joining us from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada and she's going to be talking about what we can observe at home uh, in the sky in this month of May. So Jenna, I welcome you to the proverbial stage. Hello, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for the introduction, Lindsay. My um, pleasure. And so yes, I'm Jenna. I'm the Youth Outreach Coordinator at the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. And we are just a group of people who really like the sky. Um, we come in different, different sort of from different angles. So a lot of us really like going out and observing. Um, many like to take photos of the sky. Uh, some just like to play with telescopes. There's all kinds of us. Um, so I'm going to show you what's up tonight in the sky. I welcome questions, uh, and so ask them as we go. And I'm happy to to follow the things that you guys find most interesting. What I'm going to use to show you the sky is a program which you may have seen before, and it's called Stellarium. It's free, it's open source, it is technically in beta testing, so just a heads up that if you do download it, um, it might crash, but it is uh, basically a planetarium program that allows you to see what's happening up in the sky. So right now I'm in Toronto and it is 6.30, so we're here at 6.30 in Toronto. I know it doesn't look like Toronto, but bear with me. We don't want buildings in the view. Um, so this is tonight at 6.30 and I'm gonna take us through what's going to be happening this evening. So first off, we're gonna move ahead to sunset. So I'm gonna speed through time a little bit and let the sun go down. Sunset's gonna be around 8.30 tonight or so, or eight o'clock, sorry. There it goes. And as it gets a little bit darker, the stars and the planets are gonna to start to come out. I'm gonna let it go until it's about 9.45 now. I'm just gonna pause it because now it's properly dark and we can see what's up in the sky. So first off, here's a nice big wide view of our sky. I know it's not quite exactly what we would see outside. You may have more light pollution. If you're light pollution, if you're in Toronto, for example, or in Montreal, um, the light really does make it harder to see the stars, but it's pretty good. And no matter what, we do have something up in the sky tonight, uh, which is gonna make it harder for us to see any of the stars anyway. And, and that's the moon. Um, we'll talk about the moon in a second. First, I wanna show you guys something that's off in the west right now. We're gonna zoom in a little bit and that's this big bright object. And I'm sure if you go out tonight, if you don't have any clouds, you'll be able to see this. It's this nice, nice, nice bright object. It's so, so brilliant off in the west just after sunset. And that is Venus. So we do have a planet up tonight. Um, I want to show you guys something cool about Venus. So if, again, if you want to see it, you do have to go out just right after sunset. Um, even, even when the sun is still just below the horizon, you should be able to see it. And I'll show you, I'll show you something cool about Venus. Venus is really, really bright right now. And the reason it's bright is because it's pretty close to us. Um, and no matter what, uh, so I, I'm going to zoom in. I'll give you, hold on just a second. Um, I'll give you a quick close-up view of what it looks like. So to us, it'll look like a little spot, but if you get really, really, really close to it, you'll actually see that it is a crescent. Look at that. So it's lit up by the sun only on one part of it, and that's because it's actually pretty close to the sun. It's one of two planets that's between us here on Earth and the sun, um, and so that is, we have Mercury first and then Venus after that, and then we hit us, um, and so because it's so close to the sun, uh, we can only see it first of all right after or right before right after sunset or right before sunrise and we almost always see it when it's a crescent so i'll show you something kind of cool here this is tonight and it's on a it's on a path actually i'll zoom back out for a second it's on a path where it's going all the way up in the sky and then it's turning around it's coming back because it's going along its orbit and i'll show you what the orbit looks like So that's, that's the orbit of Venus there. So it came up this side of its orbit. It reached the furthest point from the sun that it could get. 
and then it's going back down the side of the orbit. This is the closer side to us. And what this means is if you're looking at the phase of Jupiter, or sorry, phase of Jupiter, phase of Venus, and that means the crescent, like the shape of the crescent and how big it is. If we go back in time, I'm gonna take us back a couple days, about a month or so, but by day. So we're gonna go back in time and it's getting smaller because it's getting further away from us. And the crescent itself is getting bigger. And that's because it's further away from the sun from our perspective. And so more of it is getting lit up. Now, this is something I learned yesterday. Yeah, yesterday. The really cool thing, you'd look at this and you'd think that this would be brighter than the thinner crescent, right? Because that's how the moon works. For example, if you see a thinner moon, it's really not very bright. And then if you see a nice big moon, then it gets really, really bright. That's not the case. It gets brighter as we're going through time because it's getting closer to us. Even though less of it is lit up, it's closer. And so it ends up being a much brighter object. So it's really, really brilliant in the sky right now. Definitely get out and take a look at that. And there's a question, can you see it from Halifax? You absolutely can. You can actually see this from anywhere in the world um, because it's even, yeah, even in the Southern hemisphere because it's so close to the sun. So definitely go take a look at Venus tonight. I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna close our date and time. And now I'm going to talk about the other object that we have up, which is the moon. I really love the moon because it's another one of those objects that no matter where you are, even if you're in the most light polluted skies, you can still see it. Even if you're in right in the middle of a city, even if you're in downtown Toronto, you can still see it. So here's our moon tonight. Our moon tonight is almost a full moon. Very exciting news about the moon is that tomorrow it's going to be a super moon, which means that it's not only going to be full, but it's also going to be as close as it gets to the earth. Um, on its on its sort of slightly wobbly, slightly elliptical orbit. Um, and so because it's so close, it makes it look extra big. Um, and that means it gets extra bright and beautiful. Tonight it is almost full, but not quite. And again, I'll show you the difference that you can see from tonight to tomorrow. So here's tonight, and then there's tomorrow. Just a little bit of extra light right along here, right there. So I have a tip for you all, for anybody who's going out to observe the moon, which is where'd they go? Try binoculars. These, they don't have to be this big. Um, they can be any pair that you know you might have lying around or you might, of your folks that, or of your parents that you might find. Make sure to ask them first. And take a look at the moon through binoculars. Binoculars are one of those things that you expect to use during the day, but the moon looks amazing through binoculars. And if you get it on a day, we're actually, I'm gonna take us back in time a little bit here so we can see a crescent. If you get it on a day like this, when it's just, just part of the moon lit up, you end up getting to see so much detail right along where that shadow is because that's sort of like the difference between daytime and nighttime on the moon. It's where the sun's setting on the moon. And what happens at sunrise and sunset is you get really, really long shadows because the sun is hitting the moon or the earth at an angle. And when you get those long shadows, you can see a ton of detail on things like craters. You can see that shadow there and you can see mountain ranges and valleys. It's really pretty cool. Ah, uh, let me check the time. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to where we were. So this is tonight again. And I'm gonna turn off our, our orbits. The one thing I will mention too about the moon and Venus and all the planets actually, it's pretty cool. They all appear on this line in the sky, this invisible line that's called the ecliptic. Um, and that line is just the, sun, the line that the sun seems to travel along during the, uh, during the year. So I'm gonna show you where the ecliptic is. That's that line there. And you can see Venus is pretty close to it and the moon is pretty close to it. I'll show you again in the morning because there's some planets that we can see just in the morning and I'll show you how they line up with the ecliptic too. But for now, I wanna do something that'll let us see the sky a little bit better because right now we, have, we still have a fair amount of light coming from the moon. And so we can't see everything super clearly. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn off the atmosphere, which means that we get to see everything perfectly. This would be like if we live, if we were looking at the sky from the moon almost where there's no atmosphere. And so you can see the Milky Way right along there. You can see everything really beautifully. There's a few more stars. This does make finding things a little bit trickier, but I'm gonna hope you guys are up to the challenge. There's, a, there's an asterism up there and an asterism is something called a, a just, just called a group of stars. 
Um, oh, I have a question, sorry, popping up. How much room and binoculars do you need to see craters on the moon? It's, you can actually see some craters without binoculars. So you don't need super, super strong binoculars. These ones are pretty large. So these have like a little marking here that tells you eight by 56. Um, and the eight tells you how many times it's magnified. So these are only magnified eight times. Some people have binoculars that, um, that are magnified 10 times. And so um, even still, you'll, you'll still be able to see the whole moon in a pair of binoculars almost always. I thought tomorrow the moon phase was another waxing gibbous. Tomorrow, no. Tomorrow is the tomorrow is the uh, is the last supermoon of 2020. Um, and then there's another question. And since we're talking about the moon, I will answer this one as well because it's related. Which is how often do solar eclipses happen? Solar eclipses happen. Oh boy, they happen. I think up to four. Nope, up to six times a year. I believe four times a year. They they can happen fairly frequently, but they don't. Um, when we say solar eclipses, that can mean a bunch of things. That can mean um, that it's only just a, a little bit of an eclipse. So that means that the moon, if the sun's here, you're, you're on Earth, here's the sun, and the moon's passing either just a tiny bit in front of it, so it just goes over just the bottom corner, um, or it passes all the way in front of it and creates a total solar eclipse. Or some cases, this one's a really neat one, it creates something called an annular eclipse, which is where it passes um, a little bit further away from Earth and closer to the sun, so the moon appears smaller and there's a ring around of light that shines around the moon. And the very cool thing about eclipses is that they always happen in pairs. So when there's a solar eclipse, there's always a lunar eclipse, uh, either two weeks before or two weeks after. Um, it's not always, again, not always spectacular. Sometimes it's only just a little bit of shadow, um, but it, they always come in twos. Lately, it seems every solar eclipse is happening on the other side of the world, but we do have a really good one coming up in uh, four years now. Yep, in almost exactly four years. Uh, and it's gonna go through Hamilton. It's not gonna go through Toronto, but it's gonna go through Hamilton, which is just Southwest of Toronto. And it's gonna go all the way up through Quebec and then through Newfoundland and Labrador as well. Um, so we'll get a very special treat because that is a total solar eclipse. Okie dokie. So onto our other things that we can find in the night sky. I'm gonna show you guys one of the easiest ones to find and I'm sure a lot of you know what it is. Uh, it's called the Big Dipper. So you can see the Big Dipper there. It's got his little pot and a handle. A lot of different cultures have seen this. Many cultures see it as a bear, which is interesting. I'll show you guys the full constellation. It's upside down right now. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep it here. Um, there's the constellation for the Big Dipper. And so that's how they see it as a bear. This is actually the tail, which I always expect it to be the head. Um, and then the head's out here and its legs are here. There are a couple different explanations for the long tail. Some people, the, the Greeks, I believe, they explained the long tail and that the, the bear was thrown up to the sky, grabbed by the tail and thrown up to the sky by her tail, which stretched it out. But my favorite one is of the, um, it's from the Haudenosaunee people in, on, in Ontario. Um, and they believe that their the bear's tail, these three stars here in the bear's tail, that's not actually the bear's tail. Those stars are hunters. They're three birds that are chasing, chasing the bear. The first one's the robin. And the bear actually does run around our night sky. And I can show you that by taking a look. We're gonna look over here. Um, I'm just focusing on the star, which I'll explain in a second. And we'll go through uh, let's go by month. So as we go through the months, I'll get a little bit closer. I'm gonna turn these off. So keep an eye, <laughs> keep an eye on the Big Dipper here. Right now it's August, and then they go in through September, and it keeps running around, running around the sky. Right now it's in November, and it's really close to the horizon. And then we get into the spring, and it comes back up again on the other side. And in the Haudenosaunee culture, with um, I'm gonna go back to May. There we go. Uh, with those three stars chasing the bear, they chase the bear all year long, all the way around. And then when it gets to the autumn, they catch up to the bear and they shoot an arrow towards the bear and it hits the bear. It doesn't, it just hurts a little bit, just like when we do when we get cut, it just bleeds a little bit. And the blood lands on the leaves of the trees and it turns them red. And so every year in the autumn, when the Big Dipper gets close to the horizon, the leaves change color. Right about here. But the bear gets better and it keeps on running and the 
birds keep on chasing it. Um, kind of neat as well in Haudenosaunee culture, that first star, the robin, it explains how the robin gets its red breast as well. So the Big Dipper doing this run around the sky is kind of cool. And the reason that it runs, seems to run around the sky is because our earth, as it spins, do I have something around? I don't, I'll use my mouse. As the earth spins, there's gonna be one point in the sky directly above where it's spinning that doesn't move. You can try this at home, as long as you're careful, by pointing your hand straight up in the air and then turning. And you'll see that your hand, your finger points at the same spot each time. Um, and in that case, the star that our Earth is point, our Earth's axis, that's what it's called as the axis, are the star that our Earth's axis is pointing at is called Polaris. And you can find Polaris because it's over the pole by looking for the Big Dipper's two stars here, these stars in the bucket. Those stars are called Merak and Dube. And if you draw a line through Merak and Dube, they point directly at that North Star, Polaris. And so if we're centered on that North Star, you can actually watch the sky run around exactly that star where we're at the first time. That star always stays in the same spot. The whole sky moves around it. Oh, I've gone back to 2019. There we go. So you can give that, get, give that a try at home. Try, uh, well, at home, tonight, outside, and see if you can find Polaris in the sky by using that trick with the Big Dipper. So look for those two pointer stars and see if you can find it. I'm going to give you guys a couple more. There's something that we do in astronomy called star hopping, which I really like. And it's, hmm, here we go. It's when you, um, oh, go away. It's when you, uh, it's when you use the stars to find your way around the night sky. So I'm going to point us towards the south. And I'm going to show you guys how to find another constellation using the Big Dipper. This one's a good one to find tonight. Um, so if you follow the arc of the Big Dipper's handle here, you can arc down through the sky to the next bright star, that's this one, and it's called Arcturus. So you can arc to Arcturus, and then from there, you can spike down to the star called Spica. Right now, the moon is right between them, so you should be able to find them relatively easily. So give it a try tonight if you can. And if it's cloudy, you can always try in a couple nights. But remember that in a couple nights, the moon won't be there. It'll have moved over a little bit. So if you find those two stars, Arcturus and Spica, they are one side of a triangle. And you can find the other side of that triangle made by this star. They're all about the same distance away from each other. Um, it, they are all pretty bright. And if you find the star, this star is called Denebola. And this triangle that it forms is called, is named after the season that we're in. So it's called the spring triangle. It's a triangle that you see in the springtime. There's also a summer triangle and a fall square and then a winter hexagon. People like making shapes. These, this winter, or sorry, this spring triangle is not technically a constellation. It's an asterism. So an asterism is something it's just a group of stars that's easy to find. It's not like officially recognized. The Big Dipper is technically an asterism. And then the constellation that goes with it of the bear, that's the full constellation. So now that we've found the spring triangle, we can go over and that, that star there, Denebola, which was the one in the spring triangle, is at the tail of another constellation. And it's got a very famous backwards question mark in it. I'm gonna bring up constellations again. There it is. You can see this in the city, but it's a little bit trickier to see these two stars. So you might not see that backwards question mark, but you can find this kind of weird shaped body. This is never what I expect it to be. This to me looks like a mouse or possibly an iron. It could be any number of things. And that is the one thing that's kind of odd about constellations is that they don't usually look like what they're supposed to be. This, however, if you look at it just the right way, this is actually a lion. It's got its head over here. This is its mane and it's lying down the way the Sphinx is in Egypt with its paws tucked up. So this is Leo, the constellation Leo, the lion. That's a really fun one to find. And actually it brings me to kind of a neat point. I know, I'm sure some of you have heard about the zodiac signs and I'm, I'm sure many of you know what yours is. 
I'm a Gemini, for example. And so this is Gemini over here. It's about to be mm, not quite. It's, my birthday is like a month away or so. Um, all of those zodiac signs fall on that line where the planets and the stars are, or sorry, the planets and the moon are, the ecliptic. So there's, this is Leo. Oh no, I'm gonna have trouble remembering them. I'll bring up the names. There's Cancer and Gemini and Virgo. The moon is in Virgo right now. So when you hear people talking about where the planets are and, and all that sort of stuff, um, it's to do with these constellations. So right now, the <laughs> um, Venus would be in Taurus. Taurus is just setting below the horizon. All righty. Also kind of cool, this is a neat one um, for anybody with your zodiac signs. The reason that they're, that, let's say if you were born in June, then you would be a Gemini is because that's where the sun is at that time of the year. So that is, your birthday is the only time of the year where you can't see your constellation because the sun is inside of it. Um, there's a question, uh, which is what other planets can you see in May? And I'm gonna show you the ones that you can see in the morning. So right now, Venus is the only visible planet, naked eye visible, so the one that we can see without a telescope. It's the only one that's up at nighttime, but then there are three more up in the morning. So I will show you that. I'm gonna see how we're doing for time. Okay, good, we have time. I'm going to show you a couple really cool objects that are out in space. Um, these objects are called deep sky objects and they are objects that are, so deep sky objects are anything that isn't a star and that is outside of our solar system. Um, and so that includes things like, or anything that isn't a single star. So that includes things like big clouds of dust and gas. Um, it includes other galaxies. It includes all sorts of stuff. Some of these we can see with the telescope. I'm gonna show you guys a uh, kind of a fun one and it's called the Leo triplet. Actually, first, first let me show you something else. This is, this is kind of cool. There's a, there's a big history to these objects that are so far away because you can't see many of them just from looking up at the sky as you normally would on a normal day. You need a telescope or you need something that makes it easier to see farther. And so all sorts of people have in the past created lists of these things that they found out in the sky. And I'll show you some of the objects that are up there. Um, one of the lists is called the Messier list. And that was created by a guy named Charles Messier who was looking uh, for comets in the sky. And he kept finding all of these fuzzy objects up there that weren't comets, but he didn't know what they were. So he just made a big catalog of comet-like objects. And now that's called the Messier objects, they include things like galaxies and nebulae. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, bring up some of those pictures. Let me turn these on. So um, this allows you just to see what's up there. So the little, I'm gonna increase them a little bit over time. So those little yellow circles that you see popping up, those are some of the Messier objects. A lot of those are things like clusters of stars and um, clouds, nebulae, clouds of gas. And you can see a lot of them are over here. And that's because that's where our Milky Way is. Our Milky Way is the galaxy in which we live. So it's where all of the stars that we can see in the night sky are all the stars, not everything, but all the stars. But the Milky Way is flat, more or less. So if you had, I know it's not round, but let's say this is the Milky Way. We're inside of the Milky Way. And so that means that we look through it when we're looking up at the night sky. So if you and I, if you as in you and I are both in the Milky Way, but we're on opposite sides of the Milky Way, there's so much stuff in between you and me that oftentimes we actually can't see each other. So we can't often see what's really far away in the Milky Way. There's a lot of stuff blocking the view. There's stars, there's clouds, of gas, there's all sorts of stuff. But that's only in one direction. And we do find a lot of stuff in there. We, find, we do find those clouds of dust and gas. That's what we're looking at with these yellow dots. But if we wanna see even cooler stuff, we can look straight up. There's not much. If we're looking up from inside of the Milky Way, there's not much up there. There's nothing to block our view. Of course, you may say that that means that there's also nothing to look at. <laughs> um, however, there are a ton of things to look at. They're just very specific objects. I'm gonna increase the amount that we see. Take a look at that. Those up there, those red circles, those are galaxies. So those are galaxies that we can see outside of our galaxy. Hundreds of 
millions of light years away. Tons and tons, lots and lots, lots, big, big distance here. But we can see tons of them in the springtime because the Milky Way is far away from our view. So we get this nice clear view into all of these galaxies. It's a bit chaotic, so I'm actually going to take the markers away because there are so many galaxies up there. But I want to show you a couple of galaxies that you can look at. I definitely encourage um, using this program to find, no, that's not what I want, to find, um, find some cool galaxies that you like. I'm going to show you, let's see. I'm going to show you, oh, first of all, yeah, I'll show you the Whirlpool galaxy. Where are you, Whirlpool? It's up by the Big Dipper. Where did the Big Dipper go? Oh my goodness, we're confused. There we go. Whirlpool galaxy, let me find you. There we go. So this one's really cool because you can see this. You can't see it in binoculars. You need a telescope. But if you go to one of the Royal, well, not right now, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada often has nights where we can um, go out and observe. We don't have them right now, but if you do, you can, might be able to see this one. This is the Whirlpool Galaxy. I'm going to turn off the name. This one is very cool because you can see two galaxies interacting with each other. So that's a galaxy over here that got caught in the Whirlpool Galaxy's gravity, and now they're interacting. You can also see up close, this galaxy only has two big long arms, one there and then the other one here. And it's got these red areas in it. And the red areas are areas where there are new stars forming. Okay, someone asked, can we see planetary nebulae in May? There aren't as many because most of those are focused around that band of the Milky Way, but there is one and I will show you at least, well, there's, there's more than one, but there's a really cool one uh, that I will show you, which is called hoo, 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 the Lawn Sprinkler. Here's the Lawn Sprinkler, sprinkler, neb sprinkler Nebula. Um, a planetary nebula is kind of cool. It's a bit of a, uh, it's called a misnomer. So like it, it's not actually anything to do with planets. It's just that in telescopes, it kind of looks like a planet because they're often disc shaped. So there's the Lawn Sprinkler Nebula. And these planetary nebulae come from a star that's exploding and it sends dust and gas out into space. And oftentimes <clears throat> that's in a circle because that's just how space works. It explodes and it goes out in this little circle. Supernovae, which are bigger explosions, these just come from smaller stars exploding. Supernovae end up in much more distinct shapes, lots of different shapes. What are the right eyepieces to see the moon and Venus? So that's a tricky question because you also have to worry about the kind of telescope you have. Um, the moon is, is, if you're looking for the moon, I recommend using not a, I mean, actually pretty high magnification eyepieces are great, but you don't need, um, you don't need something that a telescope that captures a lot of light because uh, the moon is really, really bright. In fact, a lot of the times when you're looking at the moon, you'll want to put a filter on. And even if you're looking at it through binoculars, it helps to have sunglasses on, in fact, especially if the moon is at like a bigger phase. And then for Venus, you'll need um, a relic, again, you don't need something that captures a lot of light. So one, you'd want a, a telescope that could capture a lot of light for um, nebulae and galaxies because they're dimmer, they're not as bright. But if you're looking for the moon and Venus, which are very bright, you want something that maybe is a narrower telescope, but with a really high magnification. So then you can get really, really close, um, but it doesn't capture too much light that you end up not being able to see it properly. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay, what do we need to see the surface of Venus? That's really tricky because Venus is covered in clouds. That's one of the reasons it's so bright. Um, it's got this really, really dense, thick layer of clouds on it. So you can't see the surface of Venus with a regular telescope with visible light, with the light that we see with our eyes. You'd have to see it with um, radar, I believe, or infrared. I've seen people use radar before. So essentially, um, you know how, you know how we can use radar to figure out how far away something is. We can send probes out to Venus and then figure out what the surface of Venus looks like. It's really interesting. <laughs> it's a very strange uh, surface. The oh shoot, I'm not sure if they have it up on their website, but the Rask Ottawa chapter on YouTube they recently had a talk by someone who does research on the surface of Venus. 
So if you're interested, that's Rask Ottawa Center um, with their YouTube channel. They should have their talk up soon. That was on Friday. So I'm not sure how quickly it'll be up. <clears throat> and what is the galaxy next to the Whirlpool galaxy? This was, um, this was something that I find kind of funny that somebody included in this. I'm not sure why they included it, but hold on. So, um, come on, there we go. So there's this little galaxy here. Um, I believe it has a different, like a number category to it, but somebody has included the name, include labels, right, there we go. A justifiable, justifiable replacement for M51, um, I suppose, because they're, they're coming into interacting with each other and colliding with each other a little bit. I'm not sure what it's, let's see what it says. So it's also called NGC 5195, PGC 47413, exciting names here, um, but it has a bunch of different little names. Different groups of people have given all of these objects in space different, different names at different times. Okie dokie. So I just had another question about planets and it is, what time? 4.30. So I'm going to take us uh, away from the deep sky objects and take us into the morning. And to do that, I'm going to turn the atmosphere back on. So this is what the sky would look like tonight if we had the atmosphere in our way. That's because of the moon. Um, and here we go. I'm going to take us into the morning to show you all the planets. And at that point, I will tell you what my favorite planet is. There we go. Okay. So we're going to scoot forward into the morning a little bit here. We'll let the moon creep across the sky. I would say that my, hmm, I think my favorite planet, oh, it's hard to pick favorites. Um, I think Venus is really cool because it's out of the ordinary and that even though it's not the closest planet to the sun, it is the hottest planet in our solar system. It is far hotter than Mercury. And that's because it has all those clouds. It's got this really dense atmosphere. And so it's warmed up a ton. And so even on the side that's not facing the sun, it's hot. Unlike on Mercury, where it doesn't have an atmosphere. So the side facing the sun is really hot, but the side not facing the sun is freezing. So it ends up averaging out as not the hottest planet in the solar system. So Venus is pretty cool. Please comment with your favorite planets because I am, I am curious. So all the planets, as I mentioned with that um, ecliptic, they all fall in, in this kind of line across the sky. It's pretty low in the sky now because we're getting into the morning. There's the moon. And so can you guess which of these are planets over here? We've got three. So this is just a heads up. This is 4.15 in the morning. You can see this at about five or so, but then the sun starts to come up. It's early days for the sun right now. So we've got, anyone guess what that one is? That one's Mars, okay, and you can tell because it's red. Uh, so there's Mars, we've got Mars up. Mars is gonna look spectacular starting uh, as we move forward into October or so because it's getting really close to us. Um, and October, it'll be the closest it will be in its orbit. It's called opposition. It's when we're both on opposite sides of the sun. So like uh, the sun is here, we're in between the sun and Mars, directly in between. So we're, super, we're really close to Mars, as opposed to times when Mars is on the other side of the sun and we're over here. So Mars is gonna be big and beautiful. And we've also got Jupiter and Saturn right next to it. So Jupiter and Saturn, if you want a good view of them, you can wait until June, July, and then they start rising closer to, closer earlier in the evening. So you should be able to see them at not so late or not so early in the morning, um, but they're, they're really cool. And actually even cooler too, is that, oh, do we have time? I'm gonna try. In December, on December 21st, let's, we have centered on, there we go. On December 21st, this year, oh, silly horizon. Let me turn off the horizon. Go away earth. All right, December 21st this year, they're going to be so close to each other Look at that. Oh, oh. They're going to be so close to each other that they look like just two stars that are right next to each other. And it's going to be extremely bright. And if you have a telescope, you'll be able to see Jupiter and all its moons and Saturn and all its moons, well, the moons that we can see, in one view of the telescope. This area is less than the size of your pinky width at your arm fully stretched out. That's how big the space is. 
So it's going to be really cool. It's going to be hard to see because it'll be close to sunset. It'll be right after sunset. So you need to have a good view west right after sunset to be able to see it, but it's going to be so cool. Alrighty. That's it for our sky this evening. Um, whoa, I'm going to take us back uh, to our current time. Thank you guys so much for watching. Um, I'm sorry I didn't have a longer period for questions and answers, but if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them and I'll do my best to answer them afterwards in the comments on the YouTube video. And I think that's Thank it. Thank you, me. Jenna. Just so you know, the answers we got about favorite planets yes. included, uh, where did they go? Uranus, okay. Saturn, Mars, Jupiter, Neptune, Uranus, Mars, Neptune, Neptune. That covers Covers about all of them, yeah. <laughs> Jupiter. One one viewer said that their favorite was Kepler twenty six forty seven. That that you know to that viewer, I say good on you because I did not specify this solar system. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty great. That's Thanks a good so much one, for like joining that. us today. Um, I think that this gave everybody some really good basic tools to uh, do some observation tonight and through the rest of the month. I did include a link um, below the video in the description box to Stellarium. So if you don't have it already, you can go there and download it. Um, Jenna, I heard that you guys are having a party. Do you want to talk about that for a minute? Yes, we are having a party. So we're tomorrow night, we are having a star party. Um, we're going to have our a guest who I'm so excited for. Her name is Carissa Campbell, and she's a PhD student from York. And she actually runs Curiosity Rover and looks at the clouds on Mars. So she's driven Curiosity Rover before. I'm so excited to have her. She's going to talk about that. And then at the end, we're going to have um, some live viewing of the moon and maybe Venus. We'll see how it all goes as long as it's clear of clouds. So that is tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern time. And it runs until about 10 p.m. Eastern time. And I believe Perfect. you have the registration link somewhere, yeah? It's in the description box. So if you guys Amazing. want to be part of that uh, party tomorrow night, um, you can go check that out. Uh, especially if you're on the West Coast, um, that time frame might be, um, so might be starting, for you if you're young. Yeah, yeah. it'll be starting at 5 o'clock in Vancouver, if you're out in Vancouver. Yeah. And if not, it's okay, because it'll be on our YouTube channel afterwards. And so you can always find us at RAS, R -A -S Canada. Um, on YouTube. So it'll be up there after. Perfect. So everything you guys need is in the description box below. It's already there. Um, thank you so much again to Jenna for joining us today. If you guys enjoyed her presentation, maybe send us some like telescopes and binocular emojis in the chat uh, so that we can see how much you enjoyed this. Um, tomorrow we are having Lori Russo Nepton come visit us from Hawaii at the Canada France Hawaii Telescope um, and she's going to talk a little bit about some of the projects that they're doing over there so that'll be pretty cool um, so if you guys haven't done it already give a thumbs up to this uh, pr presentation and then subscribe to our channel and click the bell so that you know when we're online again tomorrow so I'm just gonna I guess wrap up for today um, if you guys need anything from us you can always send us an email through our website but otherwise we will see you tomorrow Thanks, guys. Bye.